All right, and we are live. So I'm just waiting for <clears throat> about 10 people to get on here, and then we'll get started. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, put them up in the chat, and I'll answer them in the second half. I would ask that if you put um, if you put uh, questions uh, up, that you also make sure that you uh, put them in all caps, only questions in all caps, and then if you just want to have any other sort of conversation back and forth that way I don't have to read it so um questions in all caps all conversation normal upper and lower case so i put the questions in the second half so hi everyone if you want to shout out go ahead and put your name up there in the chat or just say hey and i will say hey to you questions and answers in the second half after break. Sorry, just putting that up because otherwise I need to have the questions in all caps thing. So let's see. Yeah, so that should be fine. All right. Hi, everyone. And so I'll just say, give a quick shout out to Daniel Zach Smith. Thank you for the super sticker, buddy. I appreciate it. Kind of you. Um, just going to wait here a couple more seconds. I hope everyone's doing well this Saturday evening. Although I guess if you're like in Oceania someplace, it would be Saturday sort of like late afternoon, early evening. Oh, hey, that's fun. Friend of mine. Um, I'm friends with Sheila on Facebook. Be beautiful, brilliant soul. Just a very, very savvy and smart woman. And she's always incredibly grounded and very even handed and everything. Like she never, she, she, she's really good at not getting reactionary about anything um, and kind of like calling it like it is on all sides. And sometimes she's even gently reined me in on a few things. And she was always right when she did. So yeah, Sheila's a brilliant lady. So shout out to Sheila. I'm just going to um, keep this up. If you want a shout out, I'm still kind of in the shout out phase. Oh, actually we got 15 people now. We'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and get started then. So um, yeah, I'm just going to go over a few different things in here. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is how we kind of have to recognize we're in a multidimensional reality. I talk about this a lot on my channel that um, things aren't just one thing or another thing. They're not just white and black, black and white, like everybody wants. You know, everybody wants Darth Vader and the Stormtroopers, just really obvious evil with like an orchestra that plays them in, you know, to make them extra evil and scary appearing. Dun 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 Copyright strike for doing that, especially since Disney owns that now. Um, maybe if I say that song's gay, they'll they'll let me. <laughs> they'll let it slide. Um, I actually, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, people always think that bad guys are just going to announce themselves as bad guys, and yet no bad guys in history have pretty much, as far as I know, ever announced themselves as bad guys, and and very few of them seem to be in touch with the fact that they are bad guys. Quite a lot of them, they feel either they have a divine right to rule, that's very common, or that they know better than everyone else, and that if they were in charge, then they'd be able to fix everything, and then it becomes, they get, uh, you know, ends justifies the means. And so because of this, it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about this, uh, you know, I'll find it real quick here, this Luciferian versus Malachian Most High model on this channel, and for Anybody new to the channel who doesn't know what I'm talking about, it's a really, really, really important concept on this channel, something that um, sort of is a combination of coming from my own mind, but also the angels put it all together for me in a way that uh, just really made the world make a lot of sense. And so if you're not familiar with this concept, which I'm going to throw up on the screen, here's a real quick visual aid of this but i really recommend that actually you just stop watching this live stream and go and watch shadow wars episode one and it'll tell you all about this and really explain what this means and so if you're not familiar with this chart and you're not familiar with this concept of most high consciousness and also a deity known as the most high luciferian consciousness and also a deity known as lucifer and malachian consciousness and also a deity that has many many names one of which is moloch and i like that one simply because it's in the Bible and it's the enemy of King David and the Jewish people. Uh, it's the Canaanite or Phoenician god, Haman Baal, also known as Moloch by the Jews. And so I like to use that simply because it has quite a bit of resonance in Western culture. And most of my audience, if not almost all of my audience, comes from a Western 
frame of view. I mean, I now have a handful of Indian people who follow me because of uh, Bibu Dev Mesra's great work and me having him on this channel a few times. Um, and so like I have some amount of folks that are outside of Western culture, but it's not super common. And so for people who are born into, uh, you know, I don't really like the term in a lot of ways, but so-called Judeo-Christian culture or Greco-Roman Christian culture, uh, Moloch has a great resonance to it. And it's much more precise than Satan, which simply means the adversary. And so when you get into this idea that things are one way or the other, weirdly enough, and I'm actually going to just put it back up, Weirdly enough, that is actually a function of the common consciousness of this time here in Kali Yuga, which is this Iron Age consciousness, this Malachian consciousness. And you can see down here dead materialism, but also right there in the center of it and very important to it is chaotic duality and also a tendency to want to form up with like minded individuals in a hive mind and create a hive mind mentality. And you see this both on a certain section of the right with certain bigoted Christians that they might be right about a lot of things, but they very much have a hive mind and they very much all think the same thing and almost like they're getting orders from central command. And of course, you definitely see this on the left with the NPC blue hair folks who are all like, see, an NBC downloaded my latest firmware. Let me repeat the talking points. Anderson Cooper said, right? So there's also that that's that hive mind, but there's also this chaotic duality, which is the idea that things are one thing or another thing. And yet the mystics, the ancient mystics and the esoteric literature and the esoteric traditions, the metaphysical and occult traditions, which were intentionally kept hidden from the people since the time of Babylon, uh, you know, this was lowered, this kingship and this knowledge was lowered from probably higher vibrating, higher dimensional beings down to us. And we were given this knowledge. And then as we moved into Kali Yuga, the kings and the priests kept it all to themselves. The magicians kept it all to themselves and tried to hide it from the regular people. And they tried to push these ideas of dead materialism and chaotic duality, that some things that are one thing or another thing. Whereas to them, and in the occult esoteric tradition, things are often many things all at once. Symbols. And their language is very much the language, the language of symbolism. Symbols mean many things all at once. And they have different levels of meaning based on different levels of consciousness and different levels of understanding and initiation. Something that might mean something to the entered apprentice in Mason, Freemasonry means something radically different to someone in the 20th degree in Scottish Rite Freemasonry versus when you get to the 31st, 32nd degree or the 33rd degree, right? The, un, the unwritten 33rd degree, like things go through layers of, an, of revealing new dimensions to that same exact symbol. And so the rulers of this world understand the multidimensional nature of reality. Uh, perhaps the Malachians sometimes don't understand this if they're at the extreme lower ebb, they're just not intelligent enough. But the more intelligent Malachians who overlap with the lower vibrating Luciferians, right? And that's really where the shadow war that I talk about in this channel is taking place. It's taking place in that lower ebb of luciferianism and that upper tier of malachianism right that's where really the the fight is happening between these two groups uh and it would make sense that the most ruthless element of the luciferians will be the ones who take out the malachians because of course they would and so why am i saying all this well recently there's been some stuff that even i find disturbing and i just want to say i have had an enormous number of things that have been said to me by the angels that are personal prophecy come true. And so I'm going to share just a little skosh of this, just, you know, take it or don't. It's my experience. Um, I was just talking with my teenage son about it and he's very reticent to give his old man any credit for anything. Let me tell you, he's very stingy with praise or giving me credit for anyway, but even he has to admit it's startling that in 2021, the angels started telling me in late 2021 that, I would have very wealthy centimillionaire and beyond level clients and clients of extreme name and fame. And I found that impossible almost to believe like it had the ring of truth to me, but it seemed impossible at that time because at that time, uh, actually at the end of that year, I almost died in the ICU, which is worthy of a show in and of itself. And I may tell that story actually tonight, but um, prior to that, they told me that I would have, very wealthy and powerful clients as an astrologer. And I had nothing of the sort at the time. I was really, really, really struggling. I had just gone through a divorce. 
in 2020. Uh, the pandemic, of course, hit. I actually fell afoul of someone who was very dishonest, who um, tried to basically recruit me into their cult. Uh, and I almost got duped, which was very scary and made me question my own judgment. I was in terrible debt, like credit card debt and all sorts of other debt. I was doing a social work job that I hated with every fiber of my being. And I ended up quitting that and taking a leap of faith that I would be able to become an astrologer, have this channel, like do angelic magic, do all the things I do now. I didn't know back then I'd be doing angelic magic, but all the things that I do now, I took the leap of faith, but I was not successful at first. I had, you know, I remember when I hit a hundred subscribers and I was like, oh, thank God. And it was after like eight months of having the channel or something like that. This is very slow growth at first. And I remember when I hit triple digits and I was just like ecstatic that I even had hit triple digits and subscribers because I was like, oh, thank God, some sign that maybe things are going to get better. And so the angels told me, you're going to have these super wealthy clients. And I was like, that is a bold, bold call, Cotton. Let's see how that works out, right? I was feeling a bit like um, that guy from Ozark. I can't think of his name. Um, damn it. The guy from Teen Wolf 2. Why can I not think of this man's name? He's Jason Bateman. He's also in Arrested Development. It's feeling like Jason Bateman in Dodgeball. That's a bold call, Cotton. Let's see how it pays off. Not expecting it, in fact, to pay off, right? It's true now. I have multiple clients who um, either currently have access to or, or are in the process of reattaining access to nine figure plus like uh, net worths, right? And I have, uh, you know, someone who leans upon me uh, to ask me astrological advice who is uh, an absolutely brilliant man who worked at the very highest levels of finance, the smartest human being I've ever met, hands down. And that was just not the case at all. Uh, in 2021, things were pretty grim. I was with someone who was not supportive of me, undermined me at every chance, really um, supportive in some ways, but just um, super self-focused. And that was really dragging me down. And then at the end of 2021, just to top things off, I went through this insane initiation uh, and it almost killed me. And I'm going to tell that story now. Just to give an example of like, this nadir that I reached and now things are changing, not because, yay, look at Ian, he's so amazing. I'm actually saying it's clearly by the grace of the angels that much of this success that I'm having now has come to me. So it's actually the opposite. Yes, I've done a ton of internal work, but it's been just through the grace of the angels. But in order to say that when I say good things are coming, I really believe it because I've had these impossible calls that the angels have told me have come true in my own life. So I just want to tell a story that relates to all this, because this was the low point uh, pretty much almost in my life. And in my adult life, it was almost the worst moment. I, in 2021, uh, like on about the 20th of December, I started to get incredibly, I, I had been incredibly ill for like seven to 10 days with, um, so probably it would have started like maybe the 10th of December or the 12th of December of 2021. I got this insanity flu. They said when I went to the hospital that it was COVID, of course, right? Um, but I believe it was the flu, right? That I had a terrible, terrible flu at the time. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying that. I don't see why it would. Uh, I didn't say the naughty words. Um, the reason I thought it was influenza, though later it was diagnosed as the C, right? was because I was just constantly vomiting and sorry to be gross, but I just had massive, insane diarrhea and vomiting, just constantly out of both ends. I couldn't keep any water down. And I got to the point after like a week or 10 days or whatever it had been, of just constant vomiting, whatever, that I was actually like starting to convulse a little bit. And I was like, I think I just can't keep any water down. And I think I just need to go get an IV of liquid at the, at the hospital or else like I'm really getting scared. Now, mind you, I didn't want to go to the hospital at the time because I was afraid they would force me, you know, against my will to have that or, you know, that maybe that they would use the ventilator protocol, right? Which is, you know, and so I was terrified to go to the hospital, absolutely terrified, but I got so bad and twitching that I ended up going my mother because, oh yeah, I forgot to mention all this uh, where I'm hit the low point. I'm in my forties, recently divorced, broke, quit my job, living in my mother's basement, a literal 
internet stereotype and then to boot and then i'm in a horrible relationship nightmare relationship and then to boot i get this insane illness i get this insane illness and it's so bad that even though i'm terrified with the capital t terrified of going to the hospital right and this is right after i'd first started talking about moloch publicly it's about a month later after uh michael eric angel michael had come to me and said you must deliver this prophecy which went kind of small time viral on Facebook. I had hundreds of shares on it and I'd never had anything take off like that. Um, and it talked about Moloch and it talked about the end of Moloch's reign. And that's key here in a minute. So I start twitching. We go to the local, um, not ER, but urgent care. And they're like, no, we can't help you. Like we don't have, we don't have, um, you know, IVs, saline IVs here. We're sorry. Like you have to go to a hospital. And they're like, and you should go to a hospital based on what you look like. And I just give in and I let them, uh, I'm so bad that we're afraid we can't make it in time. And so we, uh, you know, before something bad happens and that was great instinct and we called an ambulance. And so, and, and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is, I'm going to be ruined. This ambulance ride is going to ruin me. Right. Uh, And so I'm just like, wow, it could not get any worse than this. And I get to the hospital and they're kind of all laughing and talking to each other when they're drawing my blood and I'm kind of like twitching there or whatever. And they kind of hold me down to do it, but they're talking to each other and they're not really paying attention. And they wheel me out in a uh, wheelchair because they did at least put me in that or I got in. Uh, yeah. The, the, the guys in the ambulance said, I'm really worried about you because we can't see what's wrong, but there's something clearly really, really wrong. So the ambulance guys kind of gave them a heads up, but they didn't really take it that seriously. And they put me in a wheelchair and they put me on the hallway and I was like, twitching uncontrollably uh it, it was i was just like going like against my will i couldn't stop it i i, I desperately wanted to stop it because everyone was staring at me and this is the other thing the hospital was just utterly packed people were spilling out in the hallways just filling it filling it right like gee i wonder why that would be at the end of 2021 right because they wouldn't say what it was and i asked them is it covid and they said no and they wouldn't say what it was and so i get up there or uh they all of a sudden come running out from the back like a dead sprint and they grab me and they're willing me like as fast as they possibly can like slamming open doors and they get in this room and there's like five people looking at me putting light my ian ian like can you hear us and blah blah and they swab my nose and i didn't even notice they gave me morphine i guess right and i didn't even feel it so let that sink in like i was given an injection of morphine and did not realize it And they said to me, you're really lucky you came in, Ian. You're really lucky you came in because if you had come in 45 minutes to an hour later, you would have had irreversible neurological damage. And we don't think you'd be alive if you come in two hours later. You're really lucky you came in. And they were furious that I hadn't taken the – and they really, like – some of them got, like, straight up mad at me and were shaking their head, you know, especially when I the, you know, the PCR said that it was the C, right? they definitely like dressed me down, which was just making my panic rise, right? My panic that they were going to forcibly or sneakily in the middle of the night do that. And so just to kick things off to like another level, I finally like, I get up in that room and they get the IV in me and that lets me like come into myself enough that I'm like, okay, angels, right? Because I'm talking to the angels by this point. I'm like, please angels, speak to me. Nothing. The angels weren't there. And I felt super abandoned. I felt super abandoned because I was so scared. I was like, I can't go to sleep. If I go to sleep, like they could, they could get me, right? They could. And I'm also thinking, oh my God, like what if my lungs start filling with fluid because they had me laying on my back and I was filled with tubes so I couldn't get comfortable to sleep, you know, all sorts of stuff in my arms and whatnot and nothing. And my now ex doesn't call me at all during this entire thing until my mom forced her to which that's what broke the glamour magic to where I sort of understand that this person was just too damaged to do anything but look out for herself, right? Like diagnosable narcissist. And I don't feel that way about, you know, I have tons of exes aren't the way. I'm not someone who lobs that at people randomly, you know. Um, My father was on that spectrum because I do believe it is a spectrum of narcissism. And so I've always somewhat been attracted to that archetype, but I've had plenty of partners who didn't distribute, uh, display that, but she certainly did. So it was like nadir relationship, had gotten out of it, had gone through divorce, total like whatever. Now I'm dying. Now the angels aren't even there. (laughs) It was literally like my darkest hour. 
And the next day, it's the 21st, it's the equinox, it's the darkest day of the year. And I'm in there and still nothing, uh, nothing from the angels, right? It's actually like when I first try and tune into the angels is on the 21st because it's midnight now. It's after midnight when I first tried to do it. I realized this later that this not hearing the angels for three days started on the 21st, which I didn't put that together at first, but it wasn't until I realized I'd gone into the hospital on the night of the 20th that I realized it was the equinox uh, or winter solstice rather. It was the darkest day of the year. Um, and yeah, there's no angels. And then the next day <clears throat> I have this nurse come in and she's just utterly cold and she's just utterly cold and like radiates evil. It's an older woman and she just has completely dead eyes. And she says, Oh, I heard you didn't take the, that's not good. And look how sick you are now. You know, a lot of people come in, they look like you and we put the ventilator in them. And then most of those people, they don't leave under their own power. People have to carry them out. That could happen to you, you know. And she says it in the most bone chilling, evil voice. I'd only met one other human that chilled me to the bone the way this woman did. And that is, and it could even be that I was seeing a spirit and I was seeing her, seeing a dark spirit in the form of this nurse. I'm super open to that possibility because she came in, she didn't check any of my vitals. It was just super weird, ultra creepy, just super weird. It didn't mean nothing about it made any sense. She didn't check my vitals. She didn't check my paperwork. She just came in and gave me this bone chilling lecture. And then I was, uh, I was like, well, I guess if that happens, that happens, but I'm ready to face that. And I just, something in me like rose up in steely resolve in response to this woman. And this woman was definitely Moloch consciousness. And the spirit of Moloch was 100% moving through her because then later that night, angels still aren't coming. And on the winter solstice of 2021, on the 21st, 1221, 21, interesting, right? the spirit of Moloch comes to me and it says, I have put you here. I could have killed you at any time. Turns out that that was a lie, but I could have killed you at any time. And you spoke out against me. Nothing can resist my will and nothing can resist my plan. You will fail. The great reset will go through. Nothing can stop what I am doing. Certainly not you. And I could kill you at a whim, speak never again of me, and like basically just threaten me not to talk about, not to talk about Moloch anymore. And it was absolutely terrifying that the angels aren't with me. This the freaking the, the spirit of Moloch has come to me. This woman came to me like did that, and I just somehow felt this steely resolve of like no, then kill me then. I won't freaking buckle under this. And two days later, or no, three days later, I get out, I get out on the 24th. And as I do, uh, the angels come to me. And then the next day, uh, the glamour magic broke around my ex because of something that will remain private, but something just way over the top and insane. And I got out of it. And then my life started this like super upward movement. So I had to go through this shamanic initiation and the angels came to me on uh actually i think it was christmas when they finally came to me and they said we couldn't no it was it was on the 24th it was right before i was released and they said we couldn't interfere and moloch had a karmic right to take you up to the doorway of death and we also knew this would function as an initiation and you stood strong you stood up against this and now because of that great things will come to you and from that point forward i started doing it was after that that i did the first choir or the first sphere of angels to so the top three choirs, which is the Ophanum, the cherubim and the seraphim. It was right before this, that I had this like shamanic doors, death initiation where Moloch's servant and Moloch him, him or herself itself came to me to threaten me. And that was like a super low point in my life to put it super mildly. And then as I worked through in 2022, 
I work through the higher spheres, I then was given that vision of the burning bush that I've sometime talked talked about in here, which I didn't even recognize what it was. I thought it was actually a nuclear mushroom cloud. They look kind of similar if you think of like a rounded bush with a little stalk lit on fire. It looks very similar to a nuclear mushroom cloud. I'd never made that connection before because when the angel showed me that vision, I thought it was that. And then a man approached me, sent me that GIF, and all of a sudden, like everything changed after that. And like got on the Sam Tripoli show, which probably a lot of you found me on there, got on all sorts of other shows, started to all of a sudden have these super high end uh, clients that I have now started to have all sorts of angelic magic students that now are like out there, I think have gone through transformational experiences, I hope, and that they're going to take their own flavor out there and help to change the world. Because what it's really about, what this time is really about, and what I hope people watching this it, take the offer to do is if you do the inner work, whether it's with the angels or otherwise, then you too can not be like me because you won't be anything like me. Well, you might be a bit like me in certain ways, but you can be you and the best version of you. And that's what's happened to me is I've gotten all this bullshit, these self-limiting belief, beliefs being stuck in that beta male, dark feminine <laughs> energy, trying to cozy up to women rather than just expressing interest or letting them be attracted to me, standing in my divine masculine right? I didn't succumb to the desire to go from the pendulum swing of dark feminine weak man to at least masculine dark masculine, which was that was very tempting to me at certain times, especially after being burned by women for the millionth time and all this pressure with red pilling and the manosphere and all that kind of stuff is very alluring to just go in that direction, right? Because I'd somewhat oscillated between those two in, in my youth um, and trying to step into that. And so everyone has that ability to step into and have those changes. But more relevant to what I want to talk about is that the angels have said very specific things to me at this point that are like exactly what they say, like in very short order. Like one time they came to me and said, in the next couple of days, you're going to meet someone of like super high level power and it's going to, you're going to be able to help, help them and help change them. And by helping to change them, it's going to have this huge ripple effect. And two days later, and again, I can't speak about it because uh, everybody would know who they are. I'm hoping I'm going to actually see them on an upcoming trip. And when I see them, I'm going to see. I doubt they'll let me talk, talk publicly about them, uh, maybe at some point. But uh, they're, they're a family name that literally probably everybody watching this would know just their last name, almost without question. And um, the the woman who has this, who comes from this line, like, She's this beautiful, wonderful, amazing woman. And it was exactly as the angel said. And so when the angels say that we will see massive, massive, massive changes starting after the 21st of March, 2025, which is just over a year from now, um, I believe them, especially when Bibba Dev Mizra's work perfectly lines up with that. And so I'm just saying that because we want things to be one way or the other way, when they can be multidimensional, or we're also witnessing fifth generational warfare and like endless shell games of subterfuge and nested up op nested psychological operations and getting inside the OODA loop, the observe, orient, um, decide, act, right? Getting inside that OODA loop of the opponent, which the Luciferians have successfully done at this point to the Malachians. The Malachians are completely making mistake after mistake after mistake because the Luciferians have gotten inside their OODA loop, which is a fifth generational warfare concept, and are getting them to react instead of act. And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because Trump said something, and I want to address it because I'm very disturbed by it. And that is Trump has recently come out and say, oh, I'm so great. I did the you know what. And now the you know what is being used to cure cancer, which he might be trying to just link that concept with cancer. It could be that, who knows? But I notice Trump will never touch that like it's a third rail. Meanwhile, Musk will talk about that, but he won't talk about electric vehicles and, and uh, smart cities and the brain chip, right? But Trump will talk about all of those things. It's almost like they have third rail things they can't touch in order to make the Malachians think that they're uh, willing to negotiate, which they're no longer willing to negotiate because they understand that the Malachians won't negotiate with anyone. They'll just 
eliminate their rivals once they consolidate power, and that includes them. They know not to, the Luciferians are not stupid and they're not going to turn the other cheek. They know they can't negotiate with these people. They might fake negotiations to buy more time, but they're not really going to negotiate. And so you see this kind of thing and you just have to like pause for a minute and go, well, let's look at, let's look at the great bulk of what they're doing and pay attention to what, what are the third rails that these individuals won't touch because different, different people have different third rails. Another very common third rail that a lot of these people won't touch is Israel. And so one of the things that uh, is a concept that I think is very fascinating, that's similar to something that the angels have talked about, which a lot of people find fascinating, the upcoming bottleneck event, is that from two different sources, in addition to the angels, I've heard this concept. One, um, actually both of them I, I, I've heard in the past. One of them is the Project Looking Glass. If you look up, there's a video uh, from like 2011 or something like that about Project Looking Glass that there was this thing where they could, they built this machine that could look into the future and it saw all these different timelines. And by seeing all these different timelines, they could rig it with game theory and so forth to, to basically control world events by understanding future possibilities and nudging things in the direction of the timeline they wanted. But what they discovered is when they moved far enough into the future, sometime around now, they didn't have a they wouldn't let a specific date out that was hidden. But this man had learned that as they moved to a certain date, there became this thing where there was like a singularity to where no matter what they did, no matter what they tried, something happened. And from that point forward, there was some kind of uh, huge spiritual awakening, huge spiritual change, and a sea change in who ran the world. And they tried many, many, many times to fix this and to try and find a way around this. And they never could. So they ended up shutting the project down. Now there's this other theory similar, right? Where there's certain physicists that have come to accept that there's you know parallel universes, call it parallel timelines, whatever you want, right? And what they've said is that now that we're in the nuclear age, the odds of a total nuclear annihilation rise just naturally over time. Over time, just because more time has occurred, there's been more chance for error, right? More chance for an actual conflict that goes to a nuclear conflict. Now, mind you, the angels have told me that'll never happen, which is interesting given what I'm about to say. And so the further out in time you move, the more likely it is that you're dealing with a per peripheral or very unlikely timeline where very unlikely events transpire in order to stab off nuclear war a little more of the future. And that the further you go in the future, the less of these timelines are that way until you reach some kind of very strange ultra outlier to where that just can't happen. And I would add, they did not, but I would add, and it becomes an impossibility. And that, that's why things are getting weirder and weirder and weirder as we move through time. Yes, there's fifth generational warfare, and that has a huge amount to do with it. There's so much weirdness happening because the entire planet's under psychological warfare uh, protocols and attacks. And so be just by the nature of that, that puts you in the liminal state. It lets you confuse, you know, be end up being confused. They're attempting to sow chaos with what's happening with, uh, you know, the weaponized immigration, all the weaponized empathy stuff, the insane stuff they're pushing into the schools, you know. The flip side of this coin is all that insane stuff that is being done by the Malachian side is, in my opinion, the Luciferians whispering in their ear, go ahead. In the past, the Luciferians would have told them to pump the brakes on their deepest madness and let's not reveal that to the public. That won't go well. And now they're doing the opposite. They're encouraging the Malachians, the Luciferians, because they're ready to split off from them. They're encouraging the Malachians to do ever more insane stuff to further expose themselves in order that they can ride in like white knights to the rescue. So you have to consider that perhaps Musk and Trump are going to say things that are, I know this is shocking, but untrue and not their actual belief or what they think in order to confuse their enemy. Basic strategy, they have to be doing that. So then the question is, is their enemy us or is their enemy a different group? I believe that if the collective elite were unified, there would be no need for propaganda or fifth generation warfare, any of that. They would just, at gunpoint, herd us into cattle cars and smart cities and 
put a brain chip in us forcefully, wipe a bunch of us out, there just wouldn't really be a conflict. The only way that there's a conflict is because there's multiple groups of elites, clearly. It has to be that way. If you look at the Revolutionary War in the U.S. and every single revolution ever in history, they've always been undergirded by some kind of geopolitical schism and a reason that there's a power shift. Let me give, give you an example. India, people will be like, oh, look at the Indians freeing themselves from the British. But did they, though? Or were the Brit was the British Empire totally exhausted from usury money manipulation for centuries, followed by two brutal world wars, which completely sacked their treasury and basically broke their power and they handed the torch to the Americans. I would say that's what happened. And they were unable to extend and hold India anymore as part of their empire. And so they basically tried to like give a big FU on their way out and did the partition between India and Pakistan, which set up India and Pakistan to fight. And they did the same thing by partitioning the Arabic Peninsula in a way that they knew would ensure conflict on the, on the Arabic Peninsula, not to mention the Balfour Declaration. So did the Indians really get out of there or was it with a huge geopolitical backdrop? Well, it was out with a huge geopolitical backdrop. Well, what about the Velvet Revolution, Czech Republic, Ian? <laughs> the CIA and KGB worked together and that brought about the fall of the Soviet Union. That's what happened there. What happened there is that that was a successful coup with, without a need for a push or violence that the CIA and quite possibly the KGB helping them allowed to happen in the Czech Republic. And here's one that nobody can deny, because that last one I just said, some people say is speculative, right? It's too recent in history. Nobody can deny this. The only reason that America won the Revolutionary War, period, is the French, 100%, who were a rival of the British for Atlanticist power. They were the primary mainland rival of the British at that time in the late 1700s as the main power. And so the Brits tipped the war in the favor of the revolutionaries. And if it hadn't been for them, there's no way that we even have that brief window. I'm of the opinion that we then got reconquered in 1812 when they put in the second bank of the United States after we tried to not renew the charter of the first bank of the United States. And then they burned Washington DC to the ground in the war of 1812. And I think ever since then, and especially after the civil war, when the uh, corporation of the United States was created, along with the district of Columbia, that we've been under, you know, the thumb of the crown. So in all of these cases where it happens, there's always, been, it's because there's a rift in the elite. You could also say there was a three layer lift and rift in the elite. There was a rift between the American elites, AKA the founding fathers and the British elites that was unaided by another group of French elites, right? From the view of the common man, that was hardly an organic happening of like the poor man rising up, right? That was not what happened there at all. It was an internecine conflict between various different groups of elites. I would argue a mix of Malachian and Luciferian uh, French elites with a primarily Malachian British elite, with a primarily Luciferian American elite merging as victorious. And But there was some element of Malachianism, right? Because there was chattel slavery, which is a pretty clear Malachian thing. So even there, it's not clear, clear cut. And that's what I'm saying. People want things to be dun, 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 dun. You know, they want the, the guys to come in wearing all black and bad with orchestral music that's nasty and then putting up billboards saying we're the bad guys <laughs> that's never happened that's not how it was in the ussr that's not how it was during national socialism in germany that's not how it was under genghis khan that's not how it was under the roman empire sure some people thought that when they were under the imperial boot of those different groups but that certainly wasn't something that they like led with in their pr campaign right and yet people like super naively think that that's how it would work. And I'm just like, guys, you do realize those are movies, right? And it's like, then they miss the parts of movies that are realistic. Like, for example, elite people conspiring to do nonsense, right? But they focus on that they think the bad guys will be super obvious when they don't realize they're making the bad guys so obvious because they recognize that half of people, like, like George Carlin, I think it was said, half of people, uh, or, or, or yeah, half of people, uh, something like half of people are uh, just have 100 IQ, which is really pretty dumb. And half the people are much dumber than that. And I'm just like, yep, pretty much on the money. And so you have to make movies and TV stuff 
for the people who might not pick up on subtleties, right? So you need to have the music playing and wearing black uniforms. But now imagine that you're a bad person and you want to take over a country. Would you really lead with that? Like, would that be your opener? By the way, um, I just want to let everyone know I'm pure evil and I plan to do evil. My platform is evil with unconscionable crimes against humanity. What do you guys think? Right? Like no one will ever, <laughs> no one will ever leave with that because it wouldn't work. Right? So just be aware that like things don't work in such a clean and clear cut way. And like the more you learn about history, the more convoluted everything becomes and the less, you know, historically, right? The, the history, all the history we have is from the Kama Yuga. And guess what? The, the bad guys win. It's the opposite of what Norm MacDonald said. Norm MacDonald said, you know, it's amazing thing about all these coup d'etats and wars. According to history, the good guys always win. They have a 100% record. They have a 100% win rate. <laughs> yeah, no. The opposite of that's true. Pretty much bad guys had a near 100% win rate over the past 6,000 years. It's super rare for someone to be at the heights of power. Like, Here's my here's my short slash long list of people who were at the pinnacles of power who were good guys. Marcus Aurelius in Rome, maybe. And that's it. Unless you believe, you know, like people in Mongolia apparently think that Genghis Khan was this great, wonderful, benevolent ruler. Or some people argue the Scythians when they go in and conquer people would civilize them and make them better or whatever, right? Like you hear arguments like that, but you're like, gosh, there sure was a lot of... There was a lot of foreplay that involved mass killing right before that civilizing, you know, white man's burden, like pith helmet, British gentleman came in. Oh, wait, I have a prop for this. Give me a second. British gentleman came in and said, by Jove, tell him I'll civilize these savages. Right? <laughs> and that's the good guys. <laughs> You know what I mean? And then most of history, it's like nobody's trying to, nobody's trying to sell you on that this historical figure was a good guy, right? Because like, like who's going to, like, how can you sell that, right? So yeah, I just want people to keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here now. Um, something very interesting is coming up, uh, which is the Great American Eclipse Part 2. I'm just going to polish this off. I got to. That is the poor man's speedball. It's some 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 weed flakes and uh, coffee. <laughs> the legal poor man's speedball. Um, Ian will discuss the upcoming eclipse and the fact that the U.S. is going into a Chiron return. Yeah. So um, we're in the midst of a Pluto return since last year. I actually have a video up on the channel, and you should check that out if you want kind of like more depth in it. But basically, Pluto has returned to exactly where it was um, at the beginning of the American Revolution. And it takes Pluto about 247 years to go around the sun. Pretty insane and pretty intense. And um, it's always easy for me to do math for the US because I just take how old I am and then I add 200 years to it because I was born during the bicentennial. So my chart being born um, almost exactly three months before the bicentennial for the United States, my chart is uh, has certain like extreme similarities to the US chart. And so, um, among those is uh, Chiron uh, is every 50 years it goes through all the signs. And Chiron is the wounded centaur. And it shows in our chart, it's one of those comets, or not comets, it's one of those asteroids that I find to be extremely powerful, extremely accurate. And like, it, it's, you know, it's difficult to discern, like, how is it that something as minor as an asteroid seems to impact the Earth? It could be that these planets and significant uh, bodies uh, somehow act as some kind of lensing effect of energy coming from the galactic center, uh, and then it makes its way to Earth. I can't exactly tell you what the physics mechanics are behind astrology. I just know it works, and that it's kind of shocking sometimes how these seemingly minor influences, like certain select asteroids, not all of them, uh, are incredibly powerful. And I would say number one with the bullet of the asteroids in terms of its impact, and my utter certainty of its impact, is Chiron, the wounded, uh, wounded healer. And the story of Chiron is that he gets wounded, I think, by the gods because he did something naughty, right? This is always Greek stories, like someone pissed off the gods and the gods dropped the hammer, right? That's like all Greek myths start with that. Or Zeus got really horny one day, and right, that's like those two causes, like human hubris and, and the freaking gods 
uh, and, and Zeus needing to uh, get some human tail were like always, always, always the cause for all the Greek myths, right? So some some guy, uh, the centaur pisses, uh, pisses off the gods, I think, and he's given this wound, right, that like just won't heal, or he somehow receives this wound. I forget that part of the story. But he then goes on this hero's journey quest, going and running down all the different healing modalities on earth in order to heal this wound that he has that just keeps weeping. And no matter what he does, it like won't close up. And it's just like really pains him. And it's really difficult. And throughout the story, he learns more and more to live with the burden of this wound and he amasses all these healing skills. And so it shows our point, our potency of like being Chiron became the most renowned healer of all time because of this journey, because he picked up all these cures looking for one for himself and unable to find it. So it's the wounded healer and it shows how there's certain wounds we have that will never fully heal. That's one of the things I've had to come to accept, uh, accept about my complex PTSD is that it will never fully heal. It's just, you know, getting more and more healed over the time. So Chiron returning to the exact point it was during the American Revolution uh, later this year, and then Pluto, which is transformation, uh, going back to the point it was right at the beginning of the uh, start of you know the American Revolution and around the time of the Declaration of Independence, is extremely fascinating because they keep trying to push, if you haven't noticed, the Second Civil War. See, because they want a civil war where brother turns against brother. What they don't want is a second American revolution. That's what they fear with every fiber of their being. And that appears to me what's happening. Although again, it's going to be, there's going to be elites leading it because of course there are, because they, it always has been. And people looking for a ground up thing. I would be more leery of ground up things because that means that whoever is creating that ground grassroots uprising that is almost certainly not happening organically is wanting to have a hidden hand in that. And I'd be more worried about that than elites like Trump openly coming out and leading something. You should be leery of that, too. But you should be really leery of something that looks like it's grassroots because almost certainly intelligence is behind it, which could be foreign intelligence that really does not have your best interests at heart. For example, the CCP, lots of evidence of that recently. So we have this return of Pluto, to death, transformation, rebirth, alchemy. Also sex, not super relevant in this case. And then also Chiron going to its return. And guess what? They all line up with this eclipse, the solar eclipse that's happening on April 8th of this year. Last time we had a great American solar eclipse was in the first six months, seven months of Trump's presidency during Trump's ascent to power. And after that, he did most of his really baller stuff by that point, as all presidents do. That's why they have that first 100 days is they just got to jam in as much as they can. Trump did a lot of stuff before that, and he did some of his big stuff after that. But quite a lot of it he had done before that eclipse. Well, we're having an eclipse again, this time in Aries, which is, uh, you know, quick to anger, leaping. Uh, it's ruled by Mars, right? I'm in Aries. Um, it's sex, but not, again, not relevant here. Uh, it's it's very often violence or anger, um, and that's where that's where Chiron is uh, in the United States. And our our country was founded, as so many are, out of an act of violence. So it makes sense that that's kind of the original wound. And that wound is actually a wound around tyranny and a seething hatred of tyranny, right? And a desire to push back against that because opposite it is is Libra justice. And Mars is kind of, and Aries is like, you know what? We're tired of waiting for justice. We're taking justice into our own hands. Frontier justice, get a rope, get a bunch of ropes, get enough ropes for, well, a lot of folks, right? I better be careful, get uh, hit here for saying naughty stuff. Um, so that seems very likely that we're going to see tumultuous events after that. And between the 25th of March, uh, and the 8th of April, right? The 25th of March is the lunar eclipse in Libra, justice and themes of justice. And then there's the total solar eclipse over a big chunk of the U.S., making an X across the U.S. That's interesting, right? Because X being in the center of the sigil of Lucifer and the United States being a Luciferian country at its founding, right? With a strong Luciferian impulse around liberty, right? That doing a cross, Trump's like getting ready to come back on like, it looks like some learned esoteric elite have planned this for a long time and that this period of time 
has probably been orchestrated for quite a long time by various groups. And so as we move forward, these timelines are collapsing, right? And there's less and less options and we're moving towards something. And I forgot to finish this off earlier, so I'll say it now called that the angels refer to as the, the bottleneck event. I do not know what this means. They say that in this bottleneck event, which they do not describe what it is or how long it lasts. I, I'm not sure if it lasts five minutes, 25 minutes, uh, five days, five weeks. I don't think it would last five years or more than a couple of years at the absolute maximum. But they basically said when we hit that bottleneck, a series of predestined events, which I believe a lot of them are going to be happening in Jerusalem, are just going to happen. And there's no force in the universe that can stop those events from unfolding. But where we do have, and so we won't even have free will either on the individual level, which will look different for every human. And it will be in the backdrop of great events, much like World War I or World War II, to where there was these great events that had to unfold. But within it, you know, there's a doughboy who runs up the beaches at Normandy and then he goes uh, to England and meets the love of his life and marries her and brings him back. It's kind of similar to my grandparents' story, right? And they, they then form a family. Like that happened in the context of this epic power struggle, right? Very human story, very faded, happening in a faded giant geopolitical event we move into this bottleneck and then we have no free will over our own physical actions which will just be kind of unfolding like we're on rails like a train you know the train can't go here or there it's got to stay on the rails right derailing i know but 99 percent of time it stays on the rails where we will have total free will is in our internal response to whatever those events are both in our personal life because they'll be very personal experience but they'll be very dramatic unfoldments at the macro level and however we respond in that time determines not so much whether we survive or not. That's kind of already destined one way or the other. But what our trajectory is when we come on the other side of that bottleneck. And as we then are moving out of the Kali Yuga and into the, the, the intermission period between Kali Yuga and Dwapara Yuga, the next Yuga, the Bronze Age, right? And so... The decisions we make will act a bit like, you know, if you start a rocket and you're sending it out to Saturn's moon, if it's off by just a little bit, by the time it gets to Saturn's moon, it's way off. And what they do sometimes is they send it up and then they'll bend it around one of the outer planets to slingshot it even further out and it will gain speed and momentum. And so we'll have the ability to, in that, through our internal response to things, which will be very much about a spiritual test of like how we're able to be spiritually within these unfolding events. And that'll determine how things unfold for us in a massive way in the um, upcoming yugas. So it's a very important period of time. It shouldn't be something that scares you because that's not going to be helpful. It should be just something to where you go, okay, I, I can do this. And like, I'm ready and start getting ready and do that in, internal work. Because if you do that internal work, wonderful things await us in like 2030 and beyond when all the bullshit has calmed down and it will probably even be mostly over it seems by like 2027 2028 i mean i'll have people say oh look at what's happening in ukraine like if there was a new war breakout it would grind and grind and grind for years look at ukraine well they're not they're doing all i mean ukraine is to war what nasa is to space the real deal space stuff all the anti-gravity free energy stuff that's they hide that Similarly, that's World War II looking stuff in Ukraine. Sure, yeah, they have some like fa fancier planes and whatever, but it's better put, it's 1980s warfare. It's early 80s warfare that's going down to a large degree over there. Sure, there's occasional hypersonic missile and yeah, there's some drones, but it's really just on the per periphery. Imagine a no holds barred knockdown drag out fight where like superpowers and like perhaps like hidden corporate militaries right like private militaries like went off like went off it's going to happen so fast it'll make people's heads spin because i mean it's going to be like people will unleash ai to hack each other's grid hack attack each other's ai collapse economies right collapse power structures freaking send in drones to freaking take out you know certain uh decision maker targets like um you know propaganda um EMPs maybe like it's going to be just completely different 
like think about the difference between static World War I with static trench warfare with artillery, right? And very occasional t tanks and you had the Red Baron and like they were kind of dinking around with flying stuff. Maybe they had some uh, freaking uh, dirigibles they flew over to drop bombs or whatever, but super primitive, right? You know, they also used gas, which they then banned that and didn't use in World War II, which is kind of amazing, the restraint there, right? They Then in World War II, it's completely the opposite of that. It's totally about dynamic movement. It's about, it's about um, it was all about production. It was all about uh, logistics, like supply, su moving production. And it was uh, about dynamic movement on the battlefield uh, on like a small you know, on both a tactical and strategic level. And it was almost completely different. Dude, those are 20 years apart, less than 20 years apart. Think of how far our technology has come. Like, it's going to just be insane. Like, it, it's hard to overstate, like, how fast things could go down. I mean, it could go down in the blink of an eye, space-based orbital weapons platforms, right? These freaking anti-grav and, like, plasma weapon freaking... Uh, you know, UFOs, for lack of a better word, like who knows how fast things could be over. But the angels have said that by 2027, 2028, it'll be pretty much all over but the Kryon for the Malachians and the Luciferians will be hunting them down. So for what it's worth, that's what they say. Um, they're sometimes wrong about timing. Um, I, based on stuff that Divu, Bibo, Dev, Mizra and others have said, it makes me more confident in this call. Plus, they've been phenomenally uh, accurate in telling me things that seemed utterly impossible to me just a few years ago, have now come to pass. I even have someone who recently found the show who um, I can't identify them, but they were deep in finance and like a new person and they were deep in finance and they know all these super deep pocketed people. And they want to talk to me about getting these golden age enclaves rolling and developing think tanks and stuff about it and funding for it. They want to have like legal agreements and structure and all this like you know, meticulous dotting your I's, crossing your T's kind of stuff, which of course you need to have if you're serious. Uh, but like even that is starting to gain life. And so I, I really think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. And I want what I want you to hear is this next period of time is about two things, survival and doing your internal work. The first one is relatively easy in the sense of you can just do things to maximize it. And if you have less resources, that means you need to do more inner work. And then you'll be naturally guided in a flow state of where you need to be, right? And if you think just because you have a bunker with a bunch of beans and gold and you can just be all paranoid and freaked out and angry and fearful and you don't have to do the internal work, you're, you're very mistaken about that. I would favor some homeless person watching this who does their inner work over someone who is taking care of, they have endless rations, endless bullets, endless bullion, right? But they, but their inner world is not right. So you should do both, if at all possible. But if you don't have the means to do the former, you should definitely do the latter. And if you have the means to do the former, do that, and then do the latter. And then if enough people are doing the pr preparation, when other good people come to them, perhaps they'll have enough extra to be able to share and help these other people, and we can help each other get through. Because the Golden Age Enclaves can't really like can't really like be building those in the middle of if there's some kind of war going on, right? Need to let the dust settle and then build those things. So that means next couple of years are about getting through this insane next few years that we're in the eye of the hurricane. I have no idea where that ends. It could it could easily be after this eclipse shortly thereafter. I'm actually going to be traveling during the middle of the eclipse briefly. And that's a little bit of a, <laughs> you know, like wipe my brow not really super advisable generally to do that, but there's certain destined faded things that I must do during that exact time period that I know are super important. And that's exactly what that mouth of the dragon time period between a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse, which is true for everyone watching this, not just me. It's a faded period. And it's a time where if you do deep introspective spiritual work, it can have a really powerful effect. And if you have business you need to do during that time or whatever, just be careful to make sure that you're doing clean honest stuff. Sure, you can be aggressive and assertive, especially if you're up against like a gigantic corporation and you're trying to close the deal or whatever, right? Like go ahead and maximize your profit, but don't do anything underhanded. If you do underhanded stuff during that period of time, it'll come back to bite you in the ass almost certainly. Um, you know, and you may have faded destined meetings with other people during that per period of time. 
you may have huge spiritual breakthroughs during that period of time. I mean, that, that's going to be a really intense period, March 25th to April 8th. And there's all sorts of additional, very challenging uh, aspects and stuff going on. The planets are moving. It's very dicey period of time. There's a lot of room for miscommunications like Pisces is either debilitated or retrograde, or excuse me, Mercury is either debilitated and sidereal Pisces or retrograde or both. <laughs> so miscommunications are very likely during that period of time. It's going to be a, a, a very interesting period of time. And we, it could be that soon that things start to happen. I also think for what it's worth, I can't prove this. And this is now speculative and isn't spiritual, but I think there's going to be a big pullback in crypto, say 30 to 40% from where it's at, because this almost always happens before the Bitcoin halving that there's like the, they get retail sucked in. They then drop the price and liquidate retail to the nth degree and beyond get retail to capitulate buy for pennies on the dollar. And then it surges upward. And then next year, the ISO 222 regulations come in January 1st, 2025. And that really looks like 2025 will be the year of crypto. But there's going to be at least one, and if not two, like utterly devastating drops in crypto. I also think there's going to be a market, uh, you know, dislocation or like collapse seems very likely to me uh, this year, talking about the main stock market. Um, I don't know when that stuff happens. Angels haven't given me a heads up on that. All that economic stuff I just said is speculation based on material things that I know, meaning stuff in the stock market, bond market, derivatives, gold, things having gold. I'll tell you what, gold is surging. If you can't afford gold, if you can't afford gold, buy it now. If you can't afford gold, get silver, get it, get it, get it. Like it's going to come a point to where you just, you can't get it. It doesn't matter what the price is. You can't get it. And then there'll be real price discovery at some point. And it does look like we're in the early stages of uh, hyperinflation. I hate to say, like, I don't know. I shop at the grocery store and I eat good, clean food. And my family eats good, clean, organic food, like almost exclusively. The little bit here and there on the sides is not organic. But I try to buy only like locally sourced meat when possible or, or minimum organic meat and organic fruits and vegetables and just kind of like higher end, cleaner, more ethical products. And that shit is freaking crazy crazy expensive. Like I swear it's gone up 20% since January. I don't care what anyone says. It's gone up 20 or 30%. That's insane. In like two and a half months, the, the, the increase in prices, I see how much more I'm spending on groceries. And it's not all happening at once, right? Like you can't just look at the same product and it keeps changing. Every one of these different product makers or farmers or whatever has a different point where they're like, Jesus Christ, I can't take it anymore. The fuel prices, the fertilizer, whatever it is, I have to pass it on to the consumer even if I'm, and, and I'm even making less profit now than I did in December, right? So, I mean, this is, this is insane. And so it looks like we're in the early stages of a hyperinflation, which makes sense if they're going to do a giant reset of some kind. So I do think that, you know, um, talk to the guys at Black Swan Capitalist. If you're well healed and you need like someone to really guide you through that, Versan and Vandell, I trust them. I think they're good. I feel like I can vouch for them. I've talked to Versan a lot. He's become a friend. Um, we're not super close friends, but, you know, we text back and forth and have phone calls now and then. And he's been on the show a couple of times. Um, they they really understand the macro picture honestly and understand this framework. Versan doesn't completely agree with me on the Luciferian versus Malachian, but he thinks something like that is happening. Like he's doing his absolute level best and he's very, very smart. And he and his brother, I think, have good strategies and are worth looking at. Um, because I can't really advise people beyond very simple stuff. ISO 222 coins. If you want to understand that's a speculative act, asset, that's like XRP, XOM, Algorand, I think ADA, Cardano is that as well. I'm not saying these are necessary ethical projects or whatever. I feel they're all Luciferian, right? But they're, there's a lot of money to be made in those fields. Um, and the ISO 222 compliant coins, which will run on the new Swiss system, seem to me the best bet. Do your own due diligence. But then what I can certainly say with absolute certainty is silver and gold. Like if you don't have that, uh, if you have excess cash and you don't have that, then you really, really should. Um, yeah. And so let's see. What else did I have notes wise? I think I've hit almost everything. I'm about to go in the Q&A. Yeah. OK, so we're going to go ahead and pause there for a break and then we'll go into Q&A in the second half. And I will get to all the stickers, especially uh, first things first, I'm just real quick finding this here break sign. Boom, there it is. And we'll make it bigger. 
because that's what she said. Um, <laughs> all right, let me get this screen up here and then um, I'm gonna mute and I'll see you guys in about five minutes. All righty, then we are back. Not sure if that was even five minutes. All right, we're going to go into the Q&A section here. So first of all, I just want to say, what's up, Daniel Smith? Thank you for the super sticker. And then Sheila came in and she said, oh, thanks. You're amazing yourself. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Someone said, any predictions for the April 8th eclipse? Um, you know, I don't think anything will... I mean, it, it, it could be, it is in that window of time where often there's um, the dark ones do bad stuff, right? The dark ones often do bad stuff between uh, like March 21st and like the end of April. Um, basically, they want to start the new um, astrological year, which starts actually on uh, March 21st. That's why the spring equinox of 2025 is really the start of the new era is because it's the beginning of that astrological cycle in from the tropical perspe perspective in tropical areas. It's also interesting that Biba Dev Mishra arrives at that date, despite that the 21st of March is not uh, as important in the Vedic sidereal system as it is in the Western tropical system. I just considered that that makes it even stronger that the angels coming up with that number is extra fascinating. Um, so I think I already hit that. And then we'll just say hi to a few people. Oswald Spangor, hey, thanks for the message on Facebook. I'm pretty much not on Facebook anymore, so, like, uh, I'm just going to delete that trash. Like, I'm just utterly sick of it. Like, I, I, I said on Facebook, oh, um, you know, like, there's a lot of bashing. of If you think going along with and bashing men and white men is, like, helping us, you know, like, you're just going along with the media. And, like, don't you think it's odd that the media suddenly turned on men and white men? so harshly in the past few years, like you don't find that odd, um, you know, that the major corporations and stuff are pushing all this anti-white, anti-men anti stuff. Um, and then all these people are like, oh, why aren't you condemning women? It's like, or I mean, condemning uh, all the bad stuff that happened to women. And I'm like, well, but I do condemn that. I condemn it often on my page. I condemn it often on my channel. I have a whole thing about divine masculine, divine feminine. And I said, men going their own way and all this stuff. And they're just, ah! 
that and all this like upset and insanity. And I'm just like, oh, right. The angels told me to get off Facebook and this is why I waste way too much of my time on this and dealing with adults, stupid uh nonsense facebook's just and twitter are just really designed to um cause conflict so let's see here hi jim jobison the third i see wow yes quite yeah don't worry the monica will make many an appearance going forward um look within said uh gutsy in uh probably meant to say something else go to I don't know what that stands for. GTSY? Look within. No idea what that says. And then someone said, Greetings, greetings, Earthly. Greetings. Greetings, Earthlings. Uh, Delina said, Hi, Ian and chat. Hey, how's it going? <clears throat> yeah, catching alive. I'm just kind of going through this. Is this a dream? If you mean reality, reality is a dream in a certain sense. Um, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. That's actually profound, deep advice um, that I think comes from that thing that I often talk about this channel of the world is illusion, right? The world's kind of a dream. And whose dream is it? It's the dream of Brahman or the God mind. So the world is illusion. Brahman alone is real. But the world is Brahman, right? That dream is appearing within the mind of Brahman and it has a purpose. So yeah, it is a dream. And that's a good thing. You can then just be really loving and you can be really brave and you can choose to be who you were meant to be. And all of you should just hit 1, 11, 11 on the video link. I happened to look up when the live hit uh, one, one hour, 11 minutes, and 11 seconds. Pretty cool. So um, I think it's funny when I was talking about, is this a dream? Yeah, it is a dream. And it's a dream that we can co-create. It's a dream where we're meant to do great, beautiful things. Everyone watching this is. Anyone watching this, if you've ever had that feeling that you're meant to do something great and you don't know what it is, I had that feeling my whole life. And now I'm now it's happening. And um, I have a Pluto right on my ascendant. And so I tend to have a very transformative effect on people. And that's why I'm, the angels told me that I'd be working with powerful people. It's, it's to help them so they can use all that wealth and power to do good, wonderful things in the world, which is like very exciting. And I, I feel really happy about that. And it's, al it's already happening. And I love that I'm helping these people and making them feel like that they can be who they want to be and then they'll be just like really wonderful powerful positive people in the world and that's very exciting you know and i feel that way about everyone i work with i'm moving into working primarily with people who are really big decision makers um but i'll always do this channel i'll always do angelic magic classes not sure if i'll always do spiritual guidance pretty soon i'm not going to be doing uh astrology charts anymore other than for um vip clients it's just too taxing um Real Nurse Ratchet. Yeah, no, that one was freaking horrifying. Saw you on the mount, subbed immediately. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah, some some folks uh, like that channel. They Man, they sure churn out content. My goodness. I've put out half as much content, and I've been online for like twice or three times as long, but they've gone all in, and I've always been trying to do this as a side sort of project along with everything else I do it. It does feed in. It does like bring me clients and has actually changed my life completely. Uh, but I just don't have the time to turn out constant con content. Cause I'm like always coaching and working with people, whether it's like high level people or people who are, you know, when I, when I say high level people, I mean, in terms of their position in, in, in society, I will say that, you know, um, it just so happens that the high level people I've worked with also happen to be very spiritually developed, but everyone I've worked with, regardless of how much income they have, there's people I worked with early on where like, you know, I felt like shy to ask for stuff and I went way over the top for them and they didn't pay me much money at all. And most of them, most everyone I've ever worked with was like very spiritually advanced. And I think people tend to be attracted to this channel who are very spiritually advanced, many of whom are, I'm sure, more advanced than me. It's just simply the content of this channel and what comes through by the grace of the angels is, uh, I think, appeals to souls that are further along in their spiritual development and that it resonates with them and that people who aren't at that stage, they're not going to they're not gonna have that, um, that same feeling. And I just remember that Relic gave me a very generous donation, so I'm going to go down and do that real quick, and then I'll uh, come back to the rest of them. But Nice to have you aboard, Delina. Um, it's a good community on this channel, too. And I'm working on getting a, 
uh, White Lotus of Light, like kind of bulletin board forum so people can exchange ideas, come together maybe locally to help each other, whatever, find friends, you know, like-minded friends who kind of have a similar worldview around some of the stuff. So, so Relic One, $20 donation. Oh, thank you so much. That's very generous of you. I appreciate your testimony. I've been going through a similar process this past year. And now it's like reality is changing right before my eyes. Looking forward to ordering a chart in the near future. Yeah, um, you definitely should do that because probably when I come back uh, in April sometime, I, I think the end of April, I've been saying this for a while. I don't know. I don't want to put a date on it. I have to have certain consistent income in place, which is on the cusp of happening. And once that's in place, then I'm not going to be doing charts uh, for the public at all because um, for the general public, it, it's just, it's too taxing. And, and the kind of work I do is very deep work. And it really only makes sense if someone wants to pay me to go ultra deep and therefore willing to pay like the amount of effort I'm actually putting in. And also I want to have this money so I can put in my part into the golden age enclaves. I need to have skin in the game. I can't be asking these powerful, wealthy people to put in all this money for these golden age enclaves if I don't have that for myself. And the thing is, is that we all, everyone watching this channel should do what they can to maximize the resources because one of the greatest tricks the devil ever pulled was convincing people that it's noble to not have any resources. You shouldn't pursue, like people either are like, totally obsessed with money and society says, Oh, be totally obsessed with money and slit throats. Oh yeah. Stab your mother in the back for a check. Absolutely. hundred percent. You should do that. And then uh, they also say, Oh, you want to be poor vow of poverty and you don't want to like have any resources to effectively challenge us. That's very noble of you. Bravo. Bravo. Oh, you want to accumulate capital to do good works in the world. How greedy of you. Look at Mr. Beast. He accumulated capital and he started doing some, doing some good works and was immediately destroyed in the media for it. Now, I'm not saying Mr. Beast is some kind of most high affiliated, like wonderful person, perfect person. He's not. He's just like a YouTube guy. But he was never criticized for these grandiose displays of just putting off a hundred thousand dollar firework display with individual fireworks that costed like 10 grand or whatever, 20 grand, one of them. Nobody criticized him for that. The minute he went drilling uh, wells in Africa and giving um, stuff to cure like river blindness or whatever, then all of a sudden like he was a white savior and tear him down. Why? Because he was putting his resources to good use and they don't like that. They pretend with their foundations and the reason they don't want actual good works done is because then it becomes obvious that like the Gates Foundation is pure, unadulterated, triple distilled evil. So... Yeah, um, definitely order that in the near future. And that's awesome to hear that you're going through a similar transformative process. I imagine a lot of people watch this channel are doing that. One of the things that has come to me is this idea of the sleeper cells of the most high, that if people had activated 10, 15 years ago, um, bad things would have happened to them because the mock in power was dominant back then, the early Obama administration. If you look in the early Bush administration, all these microbiologists were assassinated, right? Because they were prepping for 2020. Then in the 2010s, when under the Obama administration, all these naturopaths and certain kinds of dietitians and holistic medicine doctors and doctors who did um, that essence of water thing, whatever that's called. I can't think of what that's called right now. Um, but anyways, all these people who did alternative therapies were just like, they were freaking getting bodied and killed. And now who is dying? Crypto people have been dying under mysterious circumstances the past year or two, especially after FTX, a bunch of them got bumped off. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah. Uh, if you had activated back then, it might have been dangerous. But now that you're activating now, Relic One, it's because they're too distracted by this internecine conflict between multiple Malak infections, at least two. There's at least two fighting with each other, right? And I bet you there's a temporal one and a Vatican one, right? I bet you there's a religious and temporal power fight even in the West among the Malakians, but certainly it sure looks like the WF and the Chinese are on the cusp of open warfare with one another. And it's been that way for a couple of years. It's one of the things I'm shocked more people don't talk about. Soros threatened them. And then like there was the big uh, Three Gorges Dam almost burst from like obvious weather weapon use. It sure looks like China's been retaliating recently in the West. Like there's all kinds of stuff going on. That's why I call it the shadow war. And so with that as a backdrop, we can finally activate. 
we can finally activate and we can start carving out niches, spiritually speaking, energetically speaking, which will translate into real world niches for our people to survive. That we can create sort of, if you will, boy, I'm getting chills, spiritual arcs that surround us where we can help elevate the vibration of those around us and help shepherd them through this difficult period coming up in part because you'll be armed with the knowledge of to some degree what's coming. Right. And the, at least the sense that there'll be chaos and then you won't be paralyzed with fear when it happens. Right. So, yeah, if you want to get a chart, you or anyone else, you better book ASAP, because at some point in the not too distant future, I'm going to turn it off. And I'm quite serious about that because it's just way, way, way too tiring to do um, to look at people's souls and karmas. It's really exhausting. And it takes a lot out of me. And I greatly prefer to do super high level, super dialed in, super ultra specific stuff where I'm getting super granular and I'm looking at like the potas, the quarters of the, instead of just 12 signs, right? The 27 lunar mansions, the nakshatras. And then each of those are divided into another four quarters. Working with my astrological concierge platinum tier uh, client and Nick, if you're watching, what's up, bro? Um, I like have worked on him and his wife down to the pot and quarters. And I discovered hidden dimensions of power in his that really explained just how insanely powerful this man is. That wasn't necessarily immediately obvious. It was obvious that this was, that this guy was powerful, but I wouldn't have expected the level of power he has until I found these like very hidden ultra granular things. And I would have never spent that much time on a chart uh, when I'm doing like regular chart work. It's just too exhausting. I haven't even gone that deep on my own chart, almost. But I actually went deeper on my clients' charts than I have even on my own. And I've spent years researching mine. And it's exhausting. When you're looking at karma, it just drains you in a way that doesn't make sense given the relative amount of, you would think, brain power being used. The staring into the karmas, it's like staring into the Ark of the Covenant. You know what I mean? You're staring into a soul. And it's like... Whoa. And so, um, yeah, I would love to do your chart, but I would recommend booking sooner rather than later. Definitely, you know... Uh, I, would, I wouldn't wait longer than early April, that's for sure. Um, all right. Thank you so much again, Relic. That was a very generous donation. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Wow. Thank you for sharing this personal and powerful experience with us. You're very welcome, Pathfinder. I had another one where the angels then the following year in 2022 saved my life. That's a story for another time, though. But they, 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 th th there's no way, there's 0% chance that I survived what I survived without angelic intervention. I will just tell you, I drove 50 miles on ice up and down hills that dropped into S curves. And I'm talking the last 20 miles was this thick of ice rain. I had not expected it. And when I got on, I could not turn around. I had family in the car. I couldn't turn around. I had to keep going. And I'm not going to go into detail. In the future, I'll do that story because it's quite mind boggling, even to me. And at the very, very, very end, when I was like, I walked from my house, I slid into a curb and it broke both my tires and then there was two teenage boys one of which had crampons on for ice climbing and they helped take us stuff to our house i've never seen those boys before since i actually think those might have been angels and then when i got to the house the angel said we crashed your car at the end so you'd understand the miracle of what had happened before and so like i'm at the point where sometimes i question the angels because i can't believe it and my own self-worth stuff comes up but I kind of don't question them when they say extremely nutty stuff and they, they've said some stuff that's yet to come to pass. And if that happens, then I'll definitely be telling y'all and I'll be like, okay, my son can also preach to this. Like they made a prediction years ago that um, if it happens, I'm going to be jaw dropped, but I'm two degrees of separation from this person now. So it seems possible. They say I'd meet someone some someday. I'm not going to say who it is though. I'm glad you liked it, Delina. Ditto, Pathfinder. I'm glad you liked it. Ah, oh, here we go. Question. Do the angels have anything specific to say about Canada within next year? Does everyone's situation improve March 2025? Well, actually, I think that's um, if the shadow war hasn't already broken out, it seems it's going to break out this year, 2024. I just think that the decisive move is made by the Luciferians roughly around March 21st, or maybe they begin their decisive move in March 21st. I don't know how long the decisive move takes. It may be the decisive move happens as soon as January 1st, which is when the new ISO 222 system goes online. And one of the many Achilles heels of the Malachians is the financial system. And when the Luciferians who 100% run the new 
blockchain system, once they have all the backdoors, everything they built into it, once they have total control of finance like that, that could be game on right there. If the Malakians drop the internet, then it's game on. If they try and do Project Blue Rain, then it's game on. Any of those three things is game on. Those aren't the only things to where it's game on, but those three things are definitely game on. And so it seems to me like the shit can't, like it'll be astonishing if it takes until March 21st to really, of 2025 to really break out. I mean, think about it, right? Like January 2025, what, what are you going to have happen? It's pretty big. ISO 222, swift change over to the blockchain financial system happens. And then what happens on the 21st? The Trump gets sworn in, in theory? I think it's going to be super mega giga ultra hot between the election and the 21st of January. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you see Trump arrested and he's confident because the guards are actually his people. And then they turn around and free him and he goes, see, see how they tried to arrest me. And like, even though I had won, now you got to support me in arresting all these people. And I think even people like my brother might be like, wow, yeah, Biden straight up did a coup against him. I guess I do support them. And I guess you do have to arrest people who have gone that far. Right. Like, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't haven't heard anything about Canada. I kind of think you guys, I kind of think that the entire Western world, like fate hinges on what happens in the United States this year. I know that sounds grandiose to say, and I understand I'm an American and that'd be really easy to just take that as be like, oh, that's American exceptionalism, arrogance. And it could be that it is, but I don't think so. I literally think the only thing that stood between especially the Western world and total tyranny in 2020 was the United States and the fact that the Luciferians wouldn't quite let the United States go full-blown Malachian control in 2020 and since. And that the fate of the world literally, I think, hinges on what happens in the United States. And if it makes you feel any better, things look pretty dicey here for us in the sense of like, if it makes you feel any better about your extremely grim situation in Canada, I would be fucking terrified if I lived in Canada. I'm sorry, Canadians. Love you. I literally love you guys. I'm shocked at what's happened to your country. Shocked. I would have never guessed that. I had British Columbia as one of my top places I wanted to live. Sorry, New Zealanders. I wanted to move to New Zealand, number one place to live, to write out the apocalypse 20 years ago. So all the elites started building bunkers there, and horse face Arden got in control and like did all her tyrannical nonsense. And the new guy doesn't really seem any better. Um, you know, sorry, Australians who took it on the chin worse than anyone during that like you know tip of the hat to all the australians who were able to resist what happened there and uh if you had to take the you know what then like there are ways to deal with the physical symptoms um you know and so don't don't give up hope if you had to take it you know it does also help you spiritually and there's things you can do spiritually that, to get a uh, deal with it and the angels have told me there'll be total cures available by no later than like maybe 2028, 20, 2030, 20, that there'll be total cures available. And that seems like well before then. And that there's some that are already known, things like the Zelenko protocol. And, you know, look up Zelenko, look up Dr. Zelenko, look up Peter McCall, look up Robert Malone, right? Hopefully these don't get me screwed, but they do. I think it's okay to just say their names, right? Maybe they'll screw me. Um, I am moving everything over to Rumble and BitChute and other platforms. And so, you know, like, I did get that one. <laughs> That's funny. It looks like the video has gone down for a second. Okay. The video went down for a second and I was just like, wow, did I get taken down in real time? Um, yeah. So I'm moving over to BitChute and Rumble and stuff like that. And I have someone tip of the hat to Vinay who's helping me, one of my angelic magic students. So yeah. And then Relic said, I appreciate your testimony. I've been going through a similar process past year and now it looks like reality is changing. Yeah. Oh, and then you put a, and then you also did that as a super chat. Thank you so much. You are the man, good sir. Venus Wisdom said, no, the wind was accidental. He got caught by poison arrow. Makes it suck even more. Oh, this is um, Sasha Rose, a fantastic astrologer and friend. Um, yeah, she's an amazing astrologer. Um, anyone ad advise for someone with an April 7th birthday this year, turning 33? Yeah, man, I don't really... Um, well, I guess you did... Uh, you did uh, just give that donation, but 
Um, yeah, man, I would just like get a chart for your birthday is what I'd say. I, I don't think I'll be able to, I, I definitely won't be able to do one sadly on your birthday. It'll have to be right after, but turning 33 is awesome. It's a year when you'll have like tremendous power from a numer numerological point of view view. It's an eight year for everyone. 2024 reduces to an eight. So it's a collective eight year for everyone, which is abundance and karmic. And so if you've been a good boy <laughs> or girl, I don't guess now if you're a witch, I think it, you're male. Uh, Maybe not though. Uh, if you've been a, a, if you've been good the past seven years, you'll really reap a harvest this year. If you've been ethical and good primarily, um, it's also a dragon year, so that's about gathering in abundance. And so, if you have good karma coming to you, being both a dragon year and an eight year, and a thirty-three year for you, where you can really impress your stamp of you know your 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 you can really impress your will upon the world, having. Uh, a 33 year, 33 is just a very powerful number numerologically. Um, let's see, four, seven. And then if you're turning 33 this year, you were born in what, 1991. So um, four, seven, 11, 12, 21, 32. Uh, you're one shy of being a 33 year. That's right. I think so. If you if your number cond condenses to a 33, it stops. 33, 28, 22, and 11, you don't reduce it further, but you reduce any other series of numbers until you get to one number to learn your life path. So you can have one through nine, or you can have an 11, or you can have a 22, or you can have the number wealth, 28. Almost all billionaires born on the 28th. Look it up. It's crazy. Or if your year condenses to a 33, it means it's a very important uh, lifetime for you. And you have like tremendous power. In fact, Stalin tried to change the calendar in order that his birthday would numerologically reduce to 33. So it's a little bit different since it's not your actual birth year number, but, um, it is 33 year. And so that can be a very powerful year, especially if you go into it with conscious state of, I'm going to really impress my will upon the world. And I don't mean that like Stalin, right? I mean, the opposite of that. I'm going to, through process of will, become the best person I can and inspire that in people around me. So that's what I'd say to you. And uh, I will give you, un, you know, like you'll be shocked how much detail you get for a chart. Um, you should just get a chart, brother and or, or sister, and I will go uber deep and I always do. Yes, organic food is skyrocketing in California too. Yeah, definitely. Jess S. It's funny because I know another Jess S, but you don't look like you're the same one, I don't think. Um, do you ever for rebuke first and ask questions later? What do you mean rebuke? Yeah, Jesus is totally a powerful name and spirit to work with. I don't, uh, I don't know what you mean by rebuke. Um, I, you know, Yeshua, Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. And that's my, uh, that's my stance on spirits. And I get this question a lot. Like, how do you know it's not demons that you work with? Blah, blah, blah. Well, the, the proof's in the pudding. My life has become vastly more harmonious, vastly. I've become vastly less angry. I've become vastly kinder of a person. I've become a vastly better father to my son. I've become a vastly better son to my mother. I've become a better brother to my siblings. I've become a better friend to my friends. I become a more patient person, a more loving person, a more compassionate person. I'm a more charitable person. I give way more to charity now than I ever have in my life. And I just give more and more the more I get. Um, I aspire to uh, try to behave at anything approaching the template that Jesus Yeshua gave for us. Um, I believe Jesus Yeshua is one of the most beautiful beings that has ever graced this planet, like without question. Christians will be mad. They're like, that's not good enough that you think that he's an enlightened master who was deified after death and is now a full-blown deity that literally sits at the right hand of the Most High. Jesus, Yeshua is the, you know, you could argue the greatest recorded human like that we have any records of. I don't think that that would be incorrect to state. I think he's certainly on the short list with like Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, right? Um, people make an argument for Lao Tzu or Pythagoras. I don't put in that same class. Um, some people do, though. I put Jesus Yeshua right up there with literally anyone. Um, and yeah, they're a God. And yes, they were a messenger of the Most High of the Father in Heaven, 100%. So 
I leave that to you, Jess, to how do you discern whether what I'm saying resonates with you or not? You just have to trust your own internal guidance on that. And if you find that what I say don't re doesn't resonate for you, you should trust that. You should not take my word for anything. You should trust what resonates for you. What I find is things that increase harmony and peace in my life, that bring me into a state of joy, a state of presence, a state of wanting to help my fellow man, right? And I'm just saying old school term, right? All humans, women, of course, actually like women better than men, generally speaking. I really like good men, but I generally like women better than men. So when I say man, I mean both men and women. But the desire to help my fellow human beings, the desire to protect the innocent, to protect the planet and nature itself, to tend the garden, all of that has become stronger in me. And so has a steely resolve to work very hard to make this world a better place. So the proof is in the pudding for me. I have zero doubt that the beings I work with are the real angels and they've brought me tremendous peace and happiness and joy. And I hope to give some small portion of what I feel back to everyone else. And this isn't to say I don't have challenges in my life. I certainly do. And this isn't to say I'm some enlightened, flawless being. I would never make that claim, right? Or at least not until maybe that happens. But I don't see why I would say, need to say it if that had happened, right? But I'm literally denying that that's the case. I assure you, like, family member and friends would be like, oh, Ian's way better now than when he started working with the angels, but he still is a flawed human being that maybe loses his temper at things, you know? I can give you an example of my, my teen son, bless him. He accidentally lit something on fire in the house, second time he's done that. And I kind of read him the riot, riot act, and I got almost, like, uncorked rage at him because, you know, it could have, best case scenario, destroyed a lot of my wealth and on my book collection which is very dear and precious to me and a lot of objects I love and worst case could have killed our family members. And I got angry. And so I'm, I'm not flawless by any stretch, but I'm way better than I was. And it's because of working with the angels period straight up. And anyone who knows me would tell you that. And there's people in this chat that have met me off this channel. And I'm pretty much exactly the same way I am on this channel with people. I mean, I mean, I might be like, uh, sometimes I have people who watch me, they'll look, then act like I know them and I don't know them. And I, I, I let people in, but I don't let people into the inner sanctum unless I knew them really well. And people will have sort of let me in because they've watched 70 or 80 hours of me, but I don't know who they are. And so I'm a little guarded, but I'm basically exactly the same person I am on this channel. And so I would turn the question back on you. How do you discern? Because it doesn't matter how I discern. I told you how I discern, but it's up to you to discern whether or not you find the content of the channel useful. And I certainly don't expect you to be lockstep and be like, everything Ian says is the truth. If you are doing that, that's bad. And I would say to any viewer that has that, I return the power to you. No, 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 no. Understand that you came to this channel because something resonated and trust that resonance within. Don't trust me. And that's what I'd say about that. So if it resonates with you, Jess, then fantastic. And if not, then no worries. That's totally viable. Before the stream got deleted, but how how do I find my specific spiritual purpose? How do I do the inner work so I can get rid of these bad habits and deep insecurities? Well, that's a great question, but really just how you do that is, first of all, you know, um, every Archangel Michael responds to very much everyone. He's like the Archangel that's sort of most accessible, and he's a guardian, and he, and he will come if you summon him. The, believe it or not, the Shem Angels the ones that are closest to us in vibration are a little bit hard to get in contact with. There's also just your guardian angel. And again, you have to use discernment and you should feel more peace and more love. You might feel sadness as you're doing healing or whatever, but you should feel more love when you work with the angels and you can just ask the angels to help you. And even if you can't hear them like I can, which most people cannot initially, most people I believe could, but it usually takes some amount of training and opening yourself up psychically to do it. Uh, they, they'll help you energetically, even if you yourself can't feel that or whatever. What I've done a lot of is I would sit in a bath and I would summon up my trauma and remember a traumatic memory. And then I would let the tears come out, right? There could be raging sometimes that comes up first because anger is the guardian of fear. And the, the angel choir that of the virtues gives three chalices. First, they give the copper chalice, the chalice of tears. Then when people work through enough trauma, they give the silver chalice, the chalice of laughter, which helps us to transmute these energies even more. 
And then finally, we get the golden chalice, the chalice of joy, where you can feel your, your own true divine nature the way it's meant to be felt, and you feel the vibration of the most high. And so that copper chalice is best experienced by doing this because working your way up to the virtues through angelic magic is very challenging. I've never even taught anyone this thus far. I'm moving in that direction, but I haven't taught this yet. And I know you're not asking for to learn angelic magic from me. If you wanted to, that would be something you could do that basically almost all my students find very transformative, right? Because it's invocation. So you're changing things within you. But what you can do without working with angels, because maybe that's not your belief system. Run yourself a bath if you can have a bath. I really like baths. Maybe for you, being in a warm blanket or with like a heating pad. Get something that makes you feel warm and secure. If you need privacy because you're going to cry, be someplace you can be private. Maybe you have to drive your car someplace, right? And summon up, you know, be careful. I mean, if you have some kind of like serious mental illness or whatever and being destable, you might harm yourself or others, then don't do this. If you've got to be somewhat stable to do this, but summon up. Summon up like memory of the trauma I would think about, like a particular instance where I had been sexually assaulted as a child and I'd let it come up and then I would cry and cry and sob and sob and, and, and I would screen out the story, right? The story was I was victimized. The story was maybe I deserved it. The story was, oh, the horrible person, fuck them. Or, oh God, what was wrong with me? Or how did, why didn't, why wasn't I protected? Why didn't none of the adults in my life protect me? Or oh my gosh, I can't believe, like, did that even happen? I don't know, right? Oh, that's all mental noise. No, you drop into the emotion and you experience it and you you view that emotion with just as much of a loving presence, almost as though there's a small child within you that's deeply wounded. In a certain sense, this is true, the infamous inner child. I know it's a cliche, but it's really true. And you let that inner child express their grief. And I had what felt like an ocean of sadness within me. But as I did this process I'm describing where I'd remove the narrative cry as much as I could stand, alchemize it with my own loving pressure, presence and change it, it would then go out of me and it would transmute and come back into me as vitality and peace. And I would turn this poisonous grief and sadness that maybe had an oil slick of rage over parts of it. I transmuted that into more and more of this underground ocean of, of peace. And a lot of things don't rattle me anymore that used to like super disturb me because I was on the razor's edge so raw all the time because of all of my trauma. And, and, and it might take you a long time, probably because I did it so long ago. Now I really started this process in like 2012. Uh, it's been 12 years. I was sort of a forerunner of you. I'm not saying that in a, I'm better than you. I'm just saying like, it, it's kind of indisputable linearly. I did it before you, right? doesn't mean I'm better than you. Just, happened in time that way, right? It's easier now because more people have done what I did. And when you do this process now and heal yourself, you're going to make it easier and gain momentum for the next person who's courageous enough to get in touch with that. And if you're not someone who has a lot of trauma, maybe you have blind spots and dark spots and you need to see your shadow and you need to come to terms with it. For example, my shadow expressed in part because of this abuse is hardcore pornography addiction. And I actually had to accept myself and eliminate the shame. That was the hardest thing to do, eliminate the shame around it before I could let it go. The angels did really help me on that one. I'm not sure I could have done it myself. But these are some tips I have, you know. And if you're interested and you want to go deeper, like I can certainly work with you. But, you know, uh, I, charge, I, I, I charge quite a lot because my time is very, very valuable and I need to use it where I can. But I enjoy helping people here and there when I can because it's not all about money, but you know, I have to, I have to put my, my family in a position to be able to weather what's coming. And so I'm charging what I think is what my time is worth. I actually would charge more, except for, I think it would put things completely out of reach of anyone, but these VIP clients and it will happen at some point, but I'm, I'm not there yet. And I might also just not do spiritual guidance in the future. I'll always do angelic magic and this, this, I'll do some free show for sure and answer questions like these where I can. When I have time, March 23rd, 2025 is also a new Venus cycle in Aries. The Venus star first came in in April 20th, 1929. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's super interesting, especially since uh, Venus to me is the female aspect uh, of Lucifer and and like um, is, is actually the higher octave of that being, in my opinion, is the, uh, is the feminine aspect of that being. 
Uh, I believe it's the higher octave. Um, and that's why we're seeing, you know, got to stay away from the bashing men crap, which I know you don't do, Sasha, but, um, you know, uh, the rising divine feminine is definitely a big part of what's happening because the divine feminine was particularly repressed uh, in the past 6,000 years, as I know is news to pretty much nobody. Seven months before the stock market crash. Wow, yeah, that's wild. That's wild. Yeah, I don't think there'll be a crash then. I think the crash is this year, but maybe, who knows? That's interesting. Looks like Chile just got firebombed like Maui. Yeah, that happened um, also in another, some other place there in um, uh, South America also seemed to get lit up from the skies. Hey, Sasha, and then don't sweat it, bro. Um, what's the difference between Vedic and Western astrology? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of differences. In my opinion, and this is very contentious, other astrologers will disagree with me. Um, it seems that Western astrology is a mix of Chaldean, Babylonian astrology and Vedic astrology, and that uh, when Vedic astrology went through Persia, it moved from a cyclical to a uh, linear progression model and duality away from a multiplicity. And then it mixed in the milieu of the Chaldean Babylonian astrology and Arabic study of astrology because um, Arabia was the uh, where the flame of liberty and like uh, science and the arts Basically, the Luciferian impulse was kept alive while the Europe was under the boot, uh, the VBN and the, you know, uh, the Malakians, like had their boot on the neck of the Europeans at that time. And they were throwing shit out in the streets and having black plagues constantly. And so there's innumerable differences. One of them is the sidereal reckoning, which is the stars are reckoned as they appear from our perspective uh, towards the heavens, as opposed to tropical zodiac, is pinned to the equinoxes and solstices. I find both have tremendous value, and a mistake a lot of people make is trying to say one's better than the other, and the other ones must be false. That's just wrong. That's wrong-headed. They do different things. Western astrology uh, looks from the heavens down upon the earth and is focused on the individual's inner world to a large degree their psychology their spiritual drive their spiritual way of being in the world and, and especially their personality and psychological nature and vedic astrology is much more interested in the karmas of an individual what life events the person will experience they figure that that's up to you how you respond to them but i but they wanted to know what your life events were and that was banned in the west under um tiberius because prior Roman emperors had used it and the Vedic astrologers uh, were starting to get all this tremendous power in Rome. And so Di Tiberius drove them out uh, and destroyed them uh, and banned it in the West, basically banned the practice in the West, uh, in the Roman empire at the very beginning of the Roman empire, which more or less then eliminated it to a large degree in the West, basically until the Victorian age, when then the British went over and uh, conquered India and then it came back over uh, to the West via the British. So um, there are many things, and it would take several shows to even begin to scratch the surface. Like, look at all those books on my shelves. A huge amount of them are astrology books of various kinds. Um, and astrology is endlessly deep, as Sasha can tell you. Uh, thank you, Dave G. The Man. Dave G. Minor. Jesus' name didn't have any power to banish parasites, but I had good results with the Hebrew God names. Yeah, it's because um, Yeshua is the real name. Uh, if you say Jesus because J as a sound didn't really exist uh, in the West, it just doesn't have this, the, quite the same impact um, as saying Yeshua, just FYI. Um, but yeah, the Hebrew God eyes are much more likely to work. Just as thank you for answering, and what you say does resonate with me. I was just looking for a clarification. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. How do you feel about the little season theory? Jesus already came. We live in the little season reference in the Bible. I'm not sure what that means. Um, you'd have to expand on that. And it looks like we're coming to the end of questions. So I just want to encourage people, if you have any questions, now's the time. I am totally um, would love to also end the show. If people don't have questions, then I can just wrap it up somewhat early. Um, so I'll give people a couple minutes here. Skylar, if you want to um, 
expand upon that, then uh, I can answer that for you. Um, yeah, so cool. I am going to just wait a couple more moments to give people a chance to come on here. Um, I'm trying to think of like what the big takeaway is, is I guess that like, don't let the black pill get you down. Like that's one of the, another real strong theme of this channel is the black pill is so devastating. If you look at any military in all of history, but especially in ancient times, this is much more obvious. One side might be outnumbered 10 or 20 to one, right? Like the battle of St. Crispin's day was pretty bad or the battle of Thermopylae, which lasted over like seven days or something like that. A tiny, tiny, tiny group of Spartans that were utterly devoted to keeping the Greek people and the Greek culture alive fought off an absolutely unimaginable Persian Empire force of Xerxes II with just 300 men, famously immortalized in the movie 300, which I both love parts of it and it's also just real trash, right? Um, yeah, but some of it's cool. That happened because the Spartans' morale never broke. If the Spartans' morale had broken at the sight of the enemy, then as would seem to certainly happen when you're outnumbered, like 100 to 1 or whatever they were. Because it was like, it might have been 300 to 1. <laughs> it was insane. Like, I think Xerxes might have had a million strong army. But just because of the geography, the Spartans were able to hold them off long enough for the Athenians and the rest of the Greek city-states to rally a force, defeat the Persians and break their supply lines uh, in the Aegean Sea, and then be ready to meet them when they poured onto the field of Marathon, I think it is, right? Marathon famously died running to warn the Greeks. That's where Marathon comes from. He ran all the way to Greece, delivered the message and fell over dead that Xerxes was coming. It's on that same exact thing. And so the black pill is the most pernicious evil thing. That's where people think that the elites are in lockstep and can't, can't possibly be defeated. And they're all one Malachian lockstep elite Satanists. That way, defeat lies. You have to have the Stockdale paradox in mind. You have to witness what's occurring, not shrink away from it, and know with certainty that victory will occur. You don't know how. You don't know why. You just know we're going to win. And you know that with absolute certainty, we'll also not in any way ignoring what's actually happened. Admiral James von Stockdale said that was his formula for surviving the Hanoi Hilton and being tortured for like seven years. And he did. And other people broke, but he didn't because he refused to swallow the black pill of his uh, torturing, uh, not kidnappers, but whatever they call them, keeping him a hostage. Thank you for the answer. I'll keep the advice in mind. I'm so glad you liked that living three can you give more notice on when you go live? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, organization's not super my strong suit, Jim. I'm working on, like, I have, like, a um, executive assistant that's helping me, and I'm going to maybe give her more responsibilities in the future, and I'm sure that any amount <laughs> of organizational skill that comes from someone else will help improve things. I'm starting to get some help from people that's kind of arising organically. I'll eventually pay them when I can, but I just literally cannot pay them right now. Um, and so that will probably help these kind of things. Also, I don't always know because things are in flux with like when I get my son on the weekends is sometimes very much in flux and just my work schedule really depends. And I was just way too exhausted last night and I had other plans. I had to do it. I try and do it generally on Fridays, uh, but I had to do Saturday this weekend and it will be in this general time window of around 730 Pacific time to around 8.30 Pacific time for starting. I try and do it 7.30 slot for East Coast people, you know, or people who are elsewhere in the world, but I can't always do it. So just plan that it's either going to be Friday or Saturday and just look, you know, look on Fridays. And if it's not there on Fridays, I, I usually will do it live once a week and it's usually almost always a Friday or Saturday. Uh, but yes, I will try and do that. Not sure if you read my question earlier, so I'll repost it. I did not see it, Catan Dog Lady. Um, if I can't get my birth record, what's the best way to chart? Hospital doesn't have any re records after 30 plus years, LOL. Um, well, you can try to see um, if uh, you can try and see if it's um, some states keep it in the uh, birth records office. We'll actually say what time of day it was. Um, you can also look in baby books sometimes exist. Um you can have someone, not me, find someone to do it for you cheaper than I would. I really, there's one thing I loathe in astrology. It's rectification of the birth chart. Some people are super good at it. 
it's a slog for me. So you, people can rectify it by pinning certain events in your life to your chart and they can figure out what it is. It really, it, it doesn't matter tremendously for a natal chart, usually depending on if you happen to be born right when like a, your logna, your rising sign would shift from one sign to the other because sidereal astrology uses whole signs. You have like a two hour window. And now if you're at the edges of either of those two hours, so you'd go to the prior sign or go to the next sign, then your natal chart can't be accurate. But if you're under 40 and you just want a natal chart reading, you know, for maybe 35 to 40 or something like that, that I can do if you have roughly when you were born, I can just check and see. Uh, if you want to do a Navanza post 40 chart, you have to have that accurate birth time number because even 15 minutes can make an entire sign difference because it's a chart extrapolation calculation and that's very time sensitive. So yeah, that's the answer to that. Uh, birth time is afternoon. Yeah, definitely need to do better than that for even a natal chart needed within a two hour window. Ask mom. Maybe on the community section on YouTube. I don't know. I missed a lot of them though. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I understand that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Emerald Tablets and Naki Nephilim and other alien interdimensional species and their relation to... <laughs> wow, that is a um, that is a like 30-minute response, hour-long, maybe full-blown show bubble thing. I mean, like there's a lot in what you just asked, right? Like, 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 like that's a lot. Emerald Tablets, for sure. The, the one Emerald Tablet, uh, you know, as above, so below, that one's absolutely 100% real. Are the channeled ones, the emerald tablets of thought real? I believe there are emerald tablets of thought. Thought. I also believe there's other, I'm trying to decide if I can say that. I believe there's Joseph, here's what I can say. Joseph Farrell speculates based on certain records that there's other precious stone and other forms of crystal tablets that thought the Atlantean have. There's a lot of speculation, and I believe it's correct, that Atlantean technology was crystal-based and that they use crystals especially for things like holding a holographic representation of the Akashic records in a tablet, right? Well, think, think of like, think of like an uh, iPad, but it's run by spiritual technology. That's what we're talking about with the Emerald tablets. So Anunnaki Nephilim. <sighs> so definitely in ancient times, uh, aliens came here. I think they're a lot like us. I think we might even be able to have children with them. I think that what Walter Bosley says is pretty much on the money that they're probably very similar to us um, and that we would be able to maybe even have viable offspring with them level of close. I think that they just, I think they, um, I think they made a slave race out of us and that they, that's one theory. I'm not sure about that. We might just be like the side that lost an intergalactic war and that we got stuck here because we lost our technology when our side lost and we were left here kind of on this planet stripped of all our technology. This is Dr. Jo Joseph Farrell's cosmic war theory. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. And I would say, look up Dr. Joseph Farrell's cosmic war theory. And I believe something very akin to it. He says more so than the, the Sitchin model that we were slaves, like th though some of those translations are heavily contested. Um, there's definitely truth to something like that. Uh, I tend to go with somewhere between what Walter Bosley says about that aliens exactly like us are out there, that we're very common throughout the galaxy, like our species kind of like in Star Wars. We might even be the dominant species. There might be other four-limbed beings, right? Because it's like a morphogenic field thing where it's sort of like crabs, like things keep evolving into crabs over and over again, like this shape once it's in the morphogenic field is likely to replicate elsewhere in at least in our galaxy possibly throughout the universe and so probably most alien star wars kind of got it right you know like two legs two arms and a head kind of thing right that that general shape is going to be true and walter bosley contends they probably mostly look like us that we're probably the dominant main species like this and we probably maybe crash landed here we had a colony here and then had a war like the revolutionary war except for we our ancestors lost <laughs> right and that we are uh, one of the things our elites know that we don't the rest of us don't know is that these other humans are out there and they have insanely advanced technology they didn't have any fallback in technology if anything they've been able to advance it and we're way behind them technologically. 
and that that's what the elites are worried about. Truly, this is what some people say, and that could tie into this whole blocking Lucifer, Luciferian Most High thing. I find the alien factions, like when you start adding in alien stuff, it gets so insanely complicated and convoluted that it becomes not super useful to our experience here on Earth. Do I think that the aliens have come to Earth in ancient times without a shadow of a doubt? Do I think they've been coming here in recent times, especially since we kicked off radio, radar, and nuclear weapons? Yes. I think it's extremely likely. I think that the reptilian thing is definitely true based on my own experience. I just don't focus on the aspect of things because there's more cloak and da dagger subterfuge stuff in that than anywhere else. As a general, I'd say don't trust any form of extraterrestrials. Even the nice ones have less skin in the game than even the demons and djinn do here. They don't want our planet destroyed. But aliens might be like, oh, well, you know, kind of like in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where they just blow up the Earth because it's in the way of an intergalactic highway, right? Our planet just doesn't matter that much to them, right? So I would just say, like, keep your focus on the Earth until such time as there's um, open communication with other races, which I do think is coming and I do think is a real thing. I just don't think it's super useful to concentrate on right now because I really feel like what our focus needs to be at this time uh, is how we respond spiritually to this great changing of the ages. That's just my opinion, and you can, of course, believe whatever you want. Have you gotten a birth verification? Oh, hey, Heather, how's it going? Nice to see you. Uh, Asia records not detailed. Hmm, okay, yeah. Well, I'm not sure what to tell you. I think there might be a way. I would get someone to do rectification. I would get a different Vedic astrologer in India that's cheaper to do rectification of the birth chart uh, and bring it to me. And then I could ask you a couple of things and then that would solidify it for me that it was probably accurate. Um, I'm not sure how old you are. If you're over 40, then I'd be hesitant to offer my services because I really can't guarantee them if you don't have an accurate birth time. I can't guarantee a Navamsa chart. The natal chart Probably I can wing that, especially if someone rectifies it. But if you're over 40 and you want a Devonsa, <laughs> excuse me, done, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't spend my money that way if I were you. Um, I'm not trying to talk you out of it, but this shows that I'm not <laughs> just trying to get money from people, right? I want people to get an excellent service from me and nothing short of that. Have you recently requested a birth certificate in some in U.S.? Some states are recently including time of birth. It looks like they're saying they're born in Asia not sure if they themselves are Asian or if they were born on maybe a U.S. military base in Asia. Military probably has the record someplace. Maybe not, though. Where do I find this Joseph Farrell character? I always look for him. Where do I look for great videos? Um, He isn't on – that's not how you spell his name. He isn't on um, YouTube much anymore. Uh, here's Here, it's Dr. Joseph Farrell. That's how you spell his name. Uh, Giza Death Star is his uh, website, and he writes a ton on there and puts some videos on there. And then there's he does a pay, paywall membership, which is absolutely worth it. Um, Dr. Joseph Farrell is someone I super duper look up to. I think they're one of the finest sort of alternative researchers out there. Um, he always differentiates between when he does what he calls high octane, high octane speculation or way out on the limb of speculation versus stuff where he's really, really grounding in history, but he does a good job of grounding things in history. And I think that he's one of the most, uh, he's a researcher. I put a tremendous amount of stock in. I love a lot of his high octane speculation and I like that he delineates that, you know, I try and uh, delineate it on my show. Just like um, another person I really like is uh, dark journalist, dark Daniel List. Um, I feel that he similarly does fantastic research that he cites Walter Bosley. I like all these people because they're grounded and sober while looking at very, very weird stuff. <laughs> Just like stuff we do in this channel, stuff that has to do with subterfuge and aliens and ancient history and, you know, uh, alternative history, right? Um, it's a very dicey field. All of those require a tremendous amount of discernment. And I find those three gentlemen who are all friends, not an accident, I'm sure, uh, are very high integrity people in a field that's rife with disinfo agents and poorly informed people just trying to get clicks. Um, so yeah. Um, let's see. And then endless wisdom. Have you researched uh, why DNA haplogroups? Um, so would that be the male half of the DNA haplogroups? I, I haven't really that much. It's funny that your name's endless wisdom, right? Because I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people believe that endless, uh, 
maybe the bad guy, right? And that Enki is the good guy and that the bad guy won and puts uh, puts Enki down. I mean, some people believe that Enlo might be Moloch, just so you know. <laughs> Not saying anything about you, brother or sister. I'm just saying that might be a bit of a mind, but um, I tend to be a little partial to, I think Enki is Lucifer or Prometheus, right? And I think Enlil is also uh, known as, might even be Yahweh and Jehovah, uh, and it might be Haman Baal, almost certainly the Lord, uh, Moloch, Saturn, Kronos, uh, among the Greeks. Just, uh, I'm not trying to bash on you, brother. I just wanted to float that out there in case you haven't looked into that. Uh, I don't do a ton uh, of research about haplogroups and DNA. I watch some other people do it. I'm a little suspicious of it because people can use it to push narratives. And I've seen some stuff based on DNA that um, I find to be clearly false and a lie. And I know it's a lie and uh, comes out of suspect research organizations that are clearly driven by political agendas. Um, so I have mixed feelings about it. I think sometimes it can be very amazing and eye-opening and other times it seems like it's um, pure bullshit uh, to push certain propaganda narratives. I view Enlo as Leo and Enki as Aquarius. Huh. I would say Enlo is Capricorn and Enki is Aquarius. Um, uh, the higher and lower octaves of Saturn, you could also say, and I also think would be the lower, the higher octave of Moloch is Aquarius and the lower octave of uh, Lucifer is Venus or excuse me, is um, Aquarius, uh, and that there's a crossover there. Um, so the higher octave of Moloch is Aquarius. The lower octave of Moloch is Capricorn. So the higher octave of Moloch is Aquarius, and the lower octave of Lucifer is Aquarian, it seems to me. It's interesting. And I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong and I'm right. I'm just saying uh, that that's, that's certainly very interesting uh, way of looking at things. Oh, sorry. I skipped past that. Ryan said, much love from the North Carolina homestead, y'all. Much love to you. Uh, thank you. I get confused if aliens are conflated with angels and higher deities. Well, you know, like a lot of Christians say that because they want to keep things, you know, a lot of the same people who say the earth is flat also say that uh, aliens are actually um, fallen angels and demons. And I just, that theory doesn't ring true to me at all. Um I find your takes very interesting, though. Yeah, hey, right on. Likewise, I mean, I, I that that's something to give me pause and to think about. Um, and I certainly don't think you're a bad person for having Enlo in your name or anything like that. Can you say more about Venus and Lucifer? Um, well, I mean, it's the Morning Star, right? It's the Morning Star, uh, and that's one of the names for Lucifer is the Morning Star, literally. So um, Venus is the Morning Star. So. I would say that the higher octave, like the Silver Age Lucifer, is probably the female aspect of Lucifer. And the Bronze Age Lucifer is probably the male aspect of Lucifer. Um, and so that's just my personal take on things. Um, you could also say that Venus is related to, what's her name? The Egyptian Hathor. I think it's Hathor. Uh, because like X was announced on, I believe it was Hathor's feast day. Uh, the female aspect of Lucifer again. So um, I think the higher octave of, uh, I think the higher octave of Lucifer is feminine in nature and is, um, it, it, it's the female aspect of Lucifer, it's Venus. Um, so we're going into like maybe a higher octave of Mars technology, some amount of war, a lot of aggression, competition. For the Dupara Yuga, and then we'll move into, right, because the lower octave of Mars is Moloch still. Lower octave of Saturn and Mars, in my opinion, is Moloch. Um, uh, I think the higher octave of Saturn, the higher octave of Venus, the higher octave of Mercury, and the higher octave of Mars are all very important in understanding Lucifer. And I know it's a lot. I ascribe two planets to the Most High and two planets to... Uh, Moloch, right? Uh, sad, lower aspect of Saturn, and lower octave of Saturn, right? Capricorn, lower octave of Capricorn is Moloch. Lower, lower, lower octave of uh, 
Mars and war and like extreme violence and sadism is uh, also Moloch, but then the higher aspect of Saturn, Aquarius, and the higher aspect of, right, and these are traditional seven planets, I realize it differs with Western. So higher aspect of Saturn, higher aspect of Mars, right? So technology and competition um, and technology and, and th overthrowing the old way of being, right? Aquarius revolutionary thinking, right? And then you have the higher octave of Mercury, like um, transmitting sacred knowledge, right? Which the Luciferians want to do and like high levels of commerce, super fast technology, this whole quantum financial system, this um, blockchain system that's coming online. That's a higher octave of Mercury to me. Um, hopefully, right? Hopefully it plays out that way. And then finally, to kind of like balance these neutral and or masculine energies, right? You could say there's a bit of crone energy perhaps in the higher octave of Saturn, but um, uh, you have Venus uh, and the higher higher aspect or octave of Venus, I think is um, the Luciferian divine rising divine feminine. And then instead of the dark feminine, the dark masculine, which have been ruling, uh, have been ruling this, this period, time period of the Kali Yuga, right? It's called Kali Yuga, the dark feminine, right? There's some people think that dark sorceresses are actually at the tippy top. There's a site called femaleilluminati.com, which will cause your virus thing to go off if you go to it. it has a lot of information. It makes a very compelling case that the absolute higher le highest level, the priestesses and magicians are actually women that have thrown other women under the bus for 6,000 years and have actually used patriarchy as a front for their own evil machinations. And they use sadistic men as their front men, <laughs> front men. Uh, crazy, I know. Um, but dark feminine and dark masculine have been running things, you know, for the past 6,000 years. I think that's indisputable. And now we're moving into a transitional phase. And then I believe that in the golden age, it'll be um, uh, a divine feminine, divine masculine rising to meet each other and equality between the two. Um, but I do tend to see the most high as, um, which I realize are masculine in nature, uh, you know, and there's probably like higher aspect of the moon maybe comes in. I hadn't really thought of that in the most high. There's, I haven't, um, I haven't super delved into this because I think it gets tricky and, and the, the analogies start to break down potentially, like the thing I said at the beginning of the show. But I tend to ascribe the most high's energy is uh, Jupiter Kazemi, right? Zero degrees conjunct the sun because it's the higher octave of Jupiter, all that generosity, giving, grace, compassion, higher knowledge, wisdom, right? Above all else, wisdom right? F philosophical, high level stuff, a certain flavor of traditionalism to some degree. And then um, the solar avatar like Yeshua, like the higher octave of the sun, the life-giving force that d eradicates and destroys evil. You know, evil can't survive in the sunlight. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, that's the energy to me of the most high. Uh, I probably, being an embodied male, haven't delved enough into how the divine feminine is expressed. I mean, for one thing, there's what? moon and venus are ascribed to as being feminine that makes it a little tricky i mean mercury is at least like you know by curious or whatever right like it's masculine and feminine so at least there's some flexibility there but um you know there's not enough i mean i would argue there's not enough feminine energy represented in um the way we conceive of uh, astrology and that that's something to review in the future you know so anyways, those are just my thoughts on it. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, thanks for the time today. I do like your live tubes. Have a good sleep. See you next time. Thank you. Right, but also associated with Yeshua, one of his last statements, I believe. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about there. Um, hmm, I'm always curious about that association. I'm really curious about what you're talking about there. Uh, wow, very interesting. Glad to hear it. I am really, now it's been two hours. I really do need to just wrap things up. Um yeah, so it's been super awesome having you guys all on here. Much love to everyone. Um, you guys are all wonderful and beautiful souls. Thank you so much for everything you do. And I'm going to go ahead and end now, and I will catch you guys all next time. Much love. See you later, and be well. All right. Bye-bye.